All right. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this event. Uh, my name is Sofia Rusak, and today we're talking about the rise of the far right. Uh, we had a few, let's say, or we had a few elections with, with concerning, uh, rather concerning results in, in this regard. We had the EP elections, of course, in, in June, where as a result, 25, 24, 25% of members of European Parliament are now sitting to the right of the EP. So that is a share that is as high as, as never before. We had elections in France uh, where the uh, Rassemblement National did not pull first as it did in, in the in the EP elections, but uh, also there in the assembly, there are now as many MPs uh, from from that from the far right as never before. Um, and then there's another first uh, in Germany. Uh, we had two state elections. Another one is coming up uh, on Sunday, and in one of them, the AfD came first. So for the first time in Germany after Second World War, there's a far right party that won an election. So, you know, to only name a few, let's say, um, examples of a quite worrying trend. And so I was thinking, let's unpack this a little bit. Let's look at, you know, what, what's happening there. And uh, I was talking to Catherine and she told me that she's doing research on this. And I was like, okay, come to Zeps, tell us about it, put a little, you know, academic beef on the bone, so to speak. Uh, and Catherine, that is Catherine de Vries. She's a professor at Bocconi University in Italy. Welcome, Catherine. Very happy to have you here. And indeed, she's uh, studying in depth at the moment uh, the far right in Italy, France, Germany, Netherlands, and UK. So she was. She will tell us more about uh, what she's finding out. And then we have with us Sophie Pornschlegel. She's an expert on many things, uh, but she also follows very closely French and German politics. And uh, Sophie will help us to understand um, better. She's a director of research at Jacques Delors. Sorry, I should uh, mention this too. And she will help us uh, to understand a bit better um, where we stand in Germany and France. But besides, you know, zooming into member states on the matter, what I would also like to do today is to look at, you know, where are things at the EU level. And so I'm happy to have uh, Max Griera with us. He is the EP reporter from Politico. Uh, he changed from Euractiv, so many of you will still know him from there, maybe. And he is in Strasbourg right now with us uh, from Strasbourg in what is the first regular plenary week, I think we can say. And so he will uh, tell us a bit more about the dynamics inside the European Parliament and about the new uh, two far right groups that have been shaping, shaping up there. So that is a little bit, let's say, the menu uh, for the next hour. And if you have a question, then uh, please type them into the Q&A box. I will have an eye on that and then we'll try to tie them in. OK. Let's jump in. Uh, Catherine, would you mind uh, setting a bit the scene for us in a way that you tell us, first of all, very basic, but very important, what are far-right parties actually? And what, what, what are not far-right parties? Or as in, you know, what distinguishes the far-right from the right, from the conservative, um, from conservative parties? Yeah, thank you very much. Also very nice to be here. Uh, it's a bit of a word salad, as you would say in kind of a, a, in the English language uh, about the far right. And it's used often in a kind of colloquial way. But the way that I don't want to kind of go into it, all the definitions, but the academic use of it wants to say something about the far and something about the right, right? Why we why we use that. So I think it's an the what we come down on is that the far right is an umbrella term for two types of parties on the right, radical parties on the right that want to change the system by reform and extreme parties on the right. You can think maybe of a party, if I give an example, Orban and Fidesz in Hungary that actually might want to undermine parts of democracy. The, and those are called kind of extreme parties. The problem is that parties don't tell you ahead of the election which type they are, right? If they're gonna kind of circumvent the rules, yes or no. So it's that umbrella term. So that's the far element. So there could be problems, quote unquote, with democracy on that element where they would undermine some parts of democracy. Then I think the question you asked was, well, they're on the right, but like, how does that distinguish from conservative right? So one aspect would be that respect for democratic rules, right? If they are the extreme kind. The other part is that actually they're right, but in a different way that we traditionally define the right. So usually conservative parties are mobilizing on what we call the left-right dimension, more or less intervention in the economy, right? But actually far-right parties are right on the second dimension. Maybe that Macron kind of called cosmopolitanism versus nationalism, let's say, right? 
So they are very anti-immigration, nationalist, and anti-elite in their rhetoric. And that's what unites them. And But actually, on the economic part, which we traditionally think of of the right, they have various, various positions. So it's really ambiguous. In the Netherlands or in France, it might look very different than in Italy. Yeah? Meloni is not known for her social policy, for example, right? Where mm -hmm. Gerdeel is now is trying to introduce a lot of that in, 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 the, in the Dutch government. So I think to just sum up, they're far in the sense that they can sometimes undermine democracy, and that depends on if they're the extreme kind of the radical right. And they are right, but right in a different sense. They focus much more on the nationalist cosmopolitan dimension of politics, so anti-immigration, nationalist, anti-EU also, than, uh, let's say, traditional right parties that are very much about taxes, uh, growth, uh, et cetera, these kind of elements, more less state intervention in the economy. And you say they, they won't tell you that they're, that they're anti-democratic. They won't tell you, by the way, if you elect us, you know, you never get rid of us again because we want to want to abolish. But are there like, you know, and how how uh, clear are there between the lines? Let's say what are trends that you see? How 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 can people detect this or not? Yeah. Yeah, so it's really important. So two reasons, right? So one is strategic, because we do know that the average European likes democracy. So if you want to get elected, you maybe shouldn't say that you would like to undermine some parts of democracy. Although Donald Trump is actually in the US quite open about some of the things that he wants to do. So maybe, you know, as, as they get into government, we'll see different things. And also, they have different factions within them. So let's take an example of Maloney in Italy, right, it has been seen as a form of moderation on the far right. So she was in government less extreme than what she had said in campaigns, but she has factions in the party which are, you know, which clearly uh, critique, uh, wants to have forms of constitutional reform, which might not necessarily be democratic. They criticize openly judges. So mm -hmm. I, they are actually undermining ideas that have to do with what we usually call the liberal part of democracy. So not mm -hmm. elections, but uh, rule of law, Uh, division of labor uh, mm. and what they want. And you see that in the case of Maloney, for example, hey, I don't want a journalist to just be able to say whatever they want. Yeah. So in the case of Max, you know, he says whatever he wants. Uh, I would like to regulate that a little bit. So what you can, I think how you can see them or, or, or detect them early is to see if they are actually respecting the liberal part, the thicker part of democracy, which has to do with rule of law, human rights, Uh, division of of uh, of uh, uh, trias politica has so differences between the judicial side and the executive side and if they start you know criticizing that one could wonder what they would do in office and if they're more likely to also yield uh, undemocratic outcomes mm -hmm. and i think i mean with Meloni, of course a special case is that she's quite behaved on the european level right so that everybody believes or wants to believe here okay she's actually not that bad right as as we thought she is but there's there's a bit of a discrepancy in how she acts here as opposed to what she's doing at home, right? Yeah, But, I mean, uh, to be yeah. honest, on the on the influence on the media, that's a very Italian thing. That yeah. is also something Renzi tried to do, right? So it th there are some differences, but clearly when it comes to LGBTQ plus rights, when it comes to abortion, when it comes to like, let's say the human rights part, also where she's making some judicial reforms, there you can think she's very, well, I guess the way you can think about it, what they like is executive power, right? Mm -hmm. So they like, kind of strong executives. And then the question is, to what extent is a strong executive becomes anti-democratic or not, right? Like that's basically very difficult to say. And it might be also a sliding scale. We don't know if someone like Viktor Orban, you know, the first time he came to power thought, oh, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z in terms of reform. That might also happen as you see that you might lose an election, case in point also Donald Trump, that you may, may want to say, I want to change the rules because I actually want to stay in power. So I think that's the worry we have about some of the factions of people within far-right parties. And I want to ask you a little bit about the reasons, uh, you know, why people vote for far-right parties, but I, I I bet that Zofie wants to come in on this point because I've, I've heard her speaking on precisely, or making precisely that argument that is a problem with these parties that they don't go anymore. They come in uh, and then they try to uh, try to change the rules in a way that people cannot remove them anymore, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know where to start. It was extremely interesting to kind of start with the definition because I haven't heard that discussion for a long time. I used to work on um, democracy back in Germany and then on rule of law in Brussels. And it was interesting to see also the differences. I think one of the things I'd like to kind of make more maybe as a distinction first is I think there is really a difference between 
liberalism and democracy. And I think that was also something that didn't really help because we started talking about illiberal democracies for a very long time, especially when it came to Hungary. I don't think that's helpful because what we see now is that, you know, Mr. Orban and Fidesz is anti-democratic. Like the last elections we had in Hungary in 2022, there were observations there uh, and they said that it wasn't completely free and fair because you didn't have the kind of party pluralism and the media pluralism you would need to make sure that elections are uh, free and fair according to democratic standards. And I think that's the biggest issue um, I would see with far-right parties in Europe is that, you know, they, they might have I had certain ideas about liberalism that we might not share, but I think the biggest issue is that, is that we don't necessarily have the possibility afterwards, when, once they're in power, to still have that political competition. And I think that's something that's really underestimated when we discuss far-right parties in Europe, where also I saw a lot of people from democratic parties basically say, um, you know, underestimating the far right, basically saying once they're in power, you'll see that they're incompetent or um, if we kind of can contain them in a coalition, then we'll manage. And I think that's the biggest danger we can see, because what we see is that um, not only do we have a far right shift in the public sphere, which makes their ideas much more common. So there's really a shift in the Arbiton window, as you say, where, for instance, on migration, you could really see that it was a really striking example in Germany on migration that now we have a coalition government with the Social Democrats in it, which are supposed to be a progressive party, completely accepting border controls and uh, sending back migrants to Afghanistan and Syria, knowing that these countries are not safe. So really on a human rights basis, you, you, you just see this real shift in values uh, within progressive parties as well, because they imagine that in the short term, they can win elections by copying uh, what the far right is doing in the public sphere, but also on a political level to say we can contain the far right. And I think that's the biggest danger um, of underestimating them and also thinking about short term political gains, not seeing that the far right plays a much longer strategy. Um, if you look at the Rassemblement National in France, they've been there for a very, very long time. They really managed to, I mean, not to say that Gramsci is really important, but they really try to get that cultural hegemony, as you say, they do manage to do that. And it's the same in Germany with the AfD, which came around in 2013, really um, won over during the migration crisis in 2015 and has managed to really, you know, gain dominance of those topics. And now what you see is that everyone works along those lines. And if we don't completely break that and change the rules of the game and the power games, then we might end up with more far right parties in power, as you can see now in Sweden and the Netherlands and in Italy, for instance. Yeah. So before we we dive a little bit deeper into France and Germany, indeed, uh, Catherine, tell us a bit about um, the reasons. Um, so me and probably many people, we immediately see, we say migration. I mean, that must be the root cause of the rise of the far right. But I know that your research is is is, is a bit more granular. Let's say, um, tell us about. Yeah. It. So I think you can kind of put a far right 1.0 and a far right 2.0. So I think that the far right 1.0, so the first emergence that we saw, we saw that very much, let's take in the French case as an example, it's basically Front National instead of Rassemblement National. So basically the father instead of the, the daughter, right, uh, heading the party, that it was very much about immigration. Uh, that was the key element. That was the key aspect. It went into extreme forms that could be seen as anti-Semitic or racist. But at a certain point, you saw far right parties trying to moderate parts of their uh, in order to to basically increase their possible electoral uh, grasp on the system. And what happens in that case is that there is a ceiling to this anti-immigration sentiment that people who only vote based only on immigration, but that is basically a smaller group, and that's usually male, older, uh, less educated. But now we see a much more heterogeneous electoral coalition of the far right. And the reason for that is, is that it's not only about immigration. So what the far right does, it actually links a lot of issues where people are disgruntled and dissatisfied to immigration, which is an old, old, old political strategy of scapegoating certain parts of the population for the problems that are there. And my own research really shows that a couple of things are really key. So why we have seen the development of the far right, not, st not straight after the financial crisis, because actually there we saw a development of the far left. Think about Syriza, think about Podemos, et cetera, right? But later on that moved into a kind of more far right movement. And that is because austerity, uh, public service deprivation, i.e. reducing access to public services and 
and less investment at the local level takes a very, very, very long time to manifest and for people to really realize. So if you don't have a GP, you know, you get waiting lists in, uh, in healthcare, you don't have any more your post office, uh, you don't maybe have any more a local bus line. Uh, these type of grievances are much more shared amongst a larger part of the population. And what the far right has done is linked those two things. So basically saying that some of the key problems of the government not taking care of you, of breaking the social contract, that you're paying taxes. And for that, you get schools, healthcare, uh, roads, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That that is because they're spending more time on immigration or on the EU, sometimes also a favorite other second part. Right? They're, they're, they're spending money on people who are not you. And that is a way in which you get people who are not straight up super anti-immigration to also become concerned about immigration. They actually don't necessarily change their preferences. They don't say, so in some ways it is real when you have the Vox Populi on TV, when people say, I'm not a racist, but, right? Like, so I do think it's the fact that people don't go around and saying every person is horrible, but they say, but what they basically say is we have other problems in society that need fixing and need money. And what we're doing is we're spending all our political efforts and money on immigration. Oftentimes, this is not really true if you start looking at budgets, right? But but that doesn't matter. This is the perception of people. So in that way, what you can see is that the far right is basically, the summary I would give is a grievance machine. So it activates grievances and it links those grievances to immigration. So it's escaping um, immigrants for this, right? And that has been a very successful strategy to get basically in the 2.0 version, a much larger electorate than, 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 uh, than, than initially. And that's been a conscious strategy uh, of, uh, of far-right parties. And we can trace that through their programs and through their press releases and through their media appearance. So they link everything to the issue of immigration. But the interesting thing is then that the reasons why people are voting for them might not primarily be immigration. It might be other things, but they think that immigration yeah. is the culprit of that. So that's a very complicated thing to then also, uh, you know, maybe, well, you mean your next question to Sophie and Max, like, what can we do about it? That okay. shows the difficulty of, yeah. of dealing with the far right in the 2.0 version. It's a, it's a very effective narrative, right? And and this link is 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 very dangerous. And I think you also told me that Gerd Wilders was very strong in the Netherlands on linking migration with healthcare, right? With housing. Yeah. I think and housing, right? exactly. And yeah. the message, so the message of, there's not enough for you because we have to give it to other people. You know? Exactly. You exactly. don't get an appointment at the doctor. You don't get a get an appointment, or yeah. Uh, how about young people? So what we find, we've done some recent analysis on the EP election. So this is you started with the elections that have happened. For me, I live in Italy and I'm a Dutch person, so my interest in the far right was a little bit before, right? Because it was the elections that that started to see in uh, in Italy and the Netherlands already. Is basically that. Uh, that was already the case for Marine Le Pen, but very much for Maloney and Builders that did very well in 2022 and 2023, that what they did well on was uh, uh, less educated young people, mostly men, but not 100% men, right? So it's not, and that has been really a shift. And I think that is because if you, for example, link it to housing, which is a major concern for young people in Europe at the moment, or the cost of living, uh, inflation, right? also an issue for young people, that if you link it in that way, you're going to get a part of the younger population. But basically, there's a big shift in the younger population between the highly educated and the less edu and the less educated or the practical educated, right? However, whichever terminology, I don't mean less as in worthless. What I mean is differently educated, right? And there is where we see a lot of the support for for uh, for uh, the far right among young people. So it's not the case that just because younger people become older, we're going to see a collapse of the far right. There's actually a lot of support among the far right, among certain groups of young of young people. And the role of social media, um, how do you how do you assess this? I mean, there was this new study coming out in, in Germany, I think last week, which found that, um, well, it, it kind of proved what we already suspected, right, that the AfD is over dominant in, especially on TikTok, and that I think the numbers were that uh, young people were shown nine videos of the AfD per week uh, on TikTok from the AfD, but only one from the Christian Democratic CDU, and far less even from other parties. Yeah. Uh, so is this exposure, uh, is this an, an, an explanatory uh, um, 
Is it, is it explanatory? Terrible. So, I mean, I wrote in 2020 together with Sarah Holbold also a book called Political Entrepreneurs. So there's these parties are political entrepreneurial because the problem is they do not have so much access to mainstream media. So they usually seek other forms. Of, it used to be also Twitter, right? TikTok, it can be Instagram, whatever. So Meloni is also another example. Gerrit Wilders is the master of this also in many ways. So that they are very good at using social media because then they don't have to go through the quote unquote fact checking or other elements of like traditional media, right? So they have an interest in doing that. But interestingly, also other research shows that just getting your news online, which is what young people are getting, makes you much more predisposed to getting negative information about politics and especially negative information about incumbents. So there's a big study done by economists on the rollout of, of 3G, 4G, 5G. So when people are getting more and more of their information via the internet and not necessarily by traditional media, right? Or the radio, or TV, whatever, that that really creates not just more opportunities for the far right, because they're more savvy, let's say, on social media, but also that, that people are being exposed to much more negative news about mainstream parties, especially incumbents. So I think it's a combination of, of, of those two ingredients, not just the quality, let's say, of the far right online, but also the fact that actually a lot of the news that you consume online is much more negative compared to mainstream media mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the incumbents and when it comes to mainstream uh, parties. Parties. So I think that's basically the bind that many traditional parties find themselves in, that they are relying on other sources of media and the online media where they've missed the boat so far a little bit, as you are, as you as you also outlined, uh, that they are then uh, not anymore in control of the narrative. And, and I think that's very difficult uh, for those parties. And it seems that the algorithm, so within Twitter and Co, the algorithm seems to favor the negative messaging. Absolutely. It, it, we, we know see from... That Big, yeah. big studies on si in science and nature that negative news, political news penetrates further, gets shared more. Uh, the algorithm wants more engagement. So because it's shared more, you know, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, let's say. So that's definitely the case. And that hits. But the interesting thing, just one small footnote, when far right parties enter government, this also applies to them. So it would be interesting to see what what now is happening to when the far right parties are in we have to also be careful not to say it's now a linear road and the far right will always do well if they start entering government they also need to deal with these kind of developments that yeah. the mainstream parties have been dealing with for a long time yeah. um one more question and sorry um max and sophia i'm aware i'm quizzing Catherine a lot right now and <laughs> but i think it's a perfect kind of uh, setting the scene for us you know to uh, to, for her to share some of, of her latest findings. But, um, and also because you alluded to it already a little bit, Catherine, tell us more about the profile. Tell us a bit more about how you saw the profile shift of right-wing voters. Yeah, so it, it, as a kind of person who studies party strategy and so on, and now it's on the far right because they've been very successful at it. So what parties try to do is to try to construct an electoral coalition. So they try to kind of win an election by advocating strategically to certain groups and 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 adjusting their their message towards that. That's what mainstream parties used to do. That's what far right parties are also trying to do when they moved from the 1.0 to the 2.0. So in that way, they became more strategic, right? Like so, the move to more moderation is a more strategic move. And what you see is they get a more heterogeneous electoral background. So as I said, they made inroads among young people. They made inroads among higher educated men. So it's not actually, it's very gendered. So the, so the far right still has a, the strongest base is men. Uh, that's awesome. uh, but interestingly, and then we see that from the United States, they're also making inroads actually among very small, you saw that in Netherlands, among immigrant voters. So first generation, like first generation immigrants that get concerned about third generation immigrants or second generation immigrants, right? So the, it's, it's a very interesting aspect when they start broadening their message and saying, we're here to take care of, of of in Dutch, it's the the hardworking Dutch person. That's how they call it, right? Like the hard, the hardworking Dutch person. Uh, uh, we're we're there to take care of it, and and you know it's a different terminology that are used in different countries. They are linking it to problems of housing, to problems of public services, to problems of healthcare, to problems of of pensions, etc. And they are getting a much larger share of people who are dissatisfied. So I think what what you see that entire electoral coalition shares is huge dissatisfaction with the current status quo. And that's what I said, they're grievance machines. 
So they're able to articulate those grievances and they're able to mobilize those grievances. So people have grievances and then the far right links those things often to immigration or to the EU. That's their two favorite topics, uh, basically, when it comes to that. And then by mobilizing the grievance more, people become more grievanced as a result. So it becomes this, this you know, like they're... And that raises the question that would be interesting to hear what Sophia and Max will think about that, about how they then operate within the system, because that actually makes you wonder if they solve any grievances, they solve their own elector their own electoral base, which they don't want to do, right? So they want to kind of get into government, but how many of the problems do they really want to solve? Because if yeah. they're a grievance machine and that is links them to to the electorate, the question is, you know, you don't actually want to solve the grievances that you, that make you big, right? So that is the interesting element what you are now seeing when they're entering government or when they're entering more structured uh, forms of cooperation at the European level, you know. They often don't show up. They often don't don't work in committees. Yeah. They often just, you know, have debates and talk about And At least that's what the recent uh, research that I'm doing in the Dutch parliament shows. They don't go to committee. They go to the plenary debates and want all those debates to be about immigration. But they're actually not really working on bill construction, you know, like, et cetera. So I think that's also an interesting element of their of their thing. It's really an, 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 a heterogeneous electoral coalition based on grievances. And we're going to talk uh, with Max in a moment about whether or not uh, these far right parties so far have played ball in the European Parliament. Uh, but before Sophie, maybe uh, now is a good time to dip a little bit into France and Germany and uh, where you see, and Catherine is of course totally right, these were not the only elections uh, which are relevant in this context, but these were the most recent uh, ones and uh, again, uh, produce rather, you know, um, uh, shocking results. Um, so the question to you is, yeah, how do you see the situation in France and Germany? What are common lines? Uh, where do they differ? Uh, what's your take? I think it's interesting because, I mean, I, yeah, I know France and Germany most. I did work on a project also where we compared the election campaigns and results of the EP elections in France, Germany, Poland and Italy. And it was really interesting. I mean, we had a few not completely focusing on the far right, but also looking, of course, how they were faring, especially knowing that in Poland, you know, there's a bit of a not a full reverse, of course, because PIS is still very strong, the Law and Justice Party. But there's been a bit of a reversal, whether, uh, whereas, for instance, in Italy, Meloni really won those elections. In France, obviously, the far right really won. And in Germany, you could, it, might, it was more of a moderate win, I would say, for the far right, because it's not as advanced as, for instance, in France. But you can really see that they won as well. Maybe one thing on, on what Catherine just said is, I think it's interesting to see that they are... I mean, they are European trends to a certain degree when it comes, for instance, migration policy. It's a, it's an issue that really affects or that is really high up in the as a political salience in several uh, member states of the EU. But the, um, the how far right parties evolve is quite different. And in France, you had obviously this um, strategy of what they call dédiabolisation, so to make it way more mainstream, to normalize it. You could see that also with the decisions that the Rassemblement National took at EU level to say, we don't want to work with the alternative for Germany, to say, um, you know, we're much more of a, a center-right party than a far-right party, which I think is a very dangerous thing, which I also saw journalists took, took over, and I'm sure we're going to discuss this afterwards with ECR, where you have um, Brothers of Italy, which is part of it, which is a new fascist party. I don't see how they are more conservative and not far-right because they, you know, they remain in their core a far-right party. But that aside, so you have a moderation tendency in certain countries, but you also have a radicalization strategy that you see in Germany, for instance, where you did have the regional election that you mentioned, Sophia, where the far right won over 30% in Thuringia and Saxony. Maybe as a caveat, these are um, smaller Bundesländer, so they're not as big. I mean, in terms of demography, that's often, you know, underestimated. They're not very big, and Germany is quite a big country, so it needs to be put in relation as well. But in those um, Bundesländer, so in those regional states, um, the far right is really extreme. It's been um, supervised by the Verfassungsschutz, so that's like the internal um, secret service, not secret services, but the internal security to yeah. basically because they were so radical. And you could really see that they weren't so radical a few years ago and they they have radicalized. And I think there it's interesting because in the end they hope for convergence, I think. I, I think they some of them want to kind of become more mainstream while at the same time working at radicalizing that mainstream so that in the end, you know, they will gain power. And maybe to respond also to Catherine's question, in the end, 
I don't think they are constructive parties. I don't think they want to solve these grievances. I don't think they want to solve and well, do any kind of policy work. And I'm sure we're going to talk about it in the EP and what kind of role they played for now. But it's a very simple issue. If you look at Hungary, he's been managed. Orban is there since 2010 now, which is a very, very long time. He put through a constitutional reform in 2011. And since then, he's been in power because he has been eroding democracy, backsliding on democracy and on all the aspects of it. And I think that's an important thing. They always try to pretend to stay democratic. And I mean, even Putin is still, you know, trying to pretend as if there were elections. Everyone knows it's a fake. But this pretending is very important because they want to pretend to be it's a typical populist move. They want to pretend that they're still representing um, the population, but in a very homogeneous way. And I think what you can see is that we we should not have that kind of thin definition of democracy, but really look at all the aspects. And I think, I mean, I, I just looked at it in a stock taking paper about how the EU, what it has been doing in the past years in democracy. And I have to say that at least they've been quite good at looking at the full spectrum so that you have, you know, media pluralism, that you look at party competition and um, whether you have free, free and fair election, electoral integrity, whether you have disinformation online. And I think social media really played a huge role in that as well. Whether you have a civil society that is free and fair and is able to do its work independently, whether you have like checks and balances, separate of powers, the judiciary needs to be independent. So there's all these aspects that play into it. And I think if you look at, you know, the case study of Hungary, unfortunately, Poland was pretty doing pretty bad as well, until it got a little bit reversed, thank God with those elections. But once you have um, the far right in power for a certain time, while managing to shift, you know, that public sphere into their ideas, then um, you have basically a crumbling down and it takes some time. So Maybe one last point about the EP elections where everyone was saying, you know, the center holds, uh, we're fine. I think that's also a little bit dangerous because what you see is, of course, there's not going to be like a massive shift from one day to the next where the far right is going to win over, you know, 30 percent in EP elections. But it's a they have a long term strategy and they're very good at like gaining more and more and more power. And in the end, it does change how also the parties that are democratic are thinking about certain policies. And I think that's quite important to check. I think at EU level, you always see the kind of, there's a bit of a um, delay, I would say, because it's obviously an aggregation of 27 member states with very different parties. You know, I mean, for instance, in, in, in Spain and in Portugal, it's not as advanced, even though you have far right parties now. So I think you also see a little bit of a delay at EU level. But I think at national level, what you can see is that there has been an advance in the past years since, I think, the economic crisis. And they maybe that's my important point is to to really look at what democratic parties are doing and whether they are taking over because the original is always better than the copy i was just looking up whether there's been empirical studies done about that and that it has been the case i think from the university of oxford and some other researchers that really said that in the short term democratic parties might win elections by you know repeating what the far right is saying but in the long term they will always lose out and i think that's really important for them to remember because in the end if you want to stop the far right or combating the far right making sure that they don't get into power positions because we know that you know it's not in the in the interest of citizens even though they might think so in the short term but in the long term it's bad for democracy and it's not necessarily responding to their grievances then we might have to look at political parties and how they respond to it and that cordon sanitaire question for me is absolutely crucial um, and i think especially political parties but also journalists and the media have a really important role to play in making sure that they don't normalize those discourses that they don't think that it's okay to repeat that and i think you what you can see in germany and i'm sorry if i'm repeating myself but it's it's quite worrying um when even progressive parties are starting to do that exactly. sorry that was quite long <laughs> no 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 but all very interesting i think it's an important point that you made many important points but especially that we had not seen a surge in the european parliament elections and we're going to move to this in a moment but i think it's um, uh, it, it, you know, it's equally dangerous if we kind of, uh, to. it's dangerous if you expect a search, it's not coming, and then you're like, okay, yeah. fine, let's carry on, you know, but we we kind of turn a blind eye on the fact that there has been a rise of uh, right-wing MEPs over the last 20, 25 years, and it is steadily rising, right? I mean, we're now looking at 24%, you know, this is already, this is already normalized for us in a way, you know? And one more question to France. So they in the in the in the EP elections they came first, and then we were all very uh, frightful looking to Paris for the parliamentary election. They didn't come first. 
Um, but, you know, it seemed that what was a very uh, difficult government finding process in, during summer, it was at least reported that this would play into the hands of uh, the RN. And also now that the new government, the Barnier government, is, uh, yeah, that, that the RN plays a role of a kingmaker, kind of. What, what's your take on that? Where does the RN stand right now? I think it's still in a good position. I mean, I wouldn't say maybe a kingmaker, but it's clear that Macron cares more about what they're think thinking than what the left is thinking, um, which surely also has to do with the fact that they're um, much more coherent as a party. You know, in, at the left, it's extremely fragmented. They tried to make a coalition um, for the legislative elections in July. They managed, which I think was um, pretty fantastic for French politics. You know, normally they're not really able on the left to kind of have coalitions. So it was like a positive step, but also a necessary one one looking at the the thirty percent that they had in the European elections, uh, Rassemblement National. I think it's interesting because in France, um, so there's been maybe to kind of put that in context also because it's more of an international or European audience. There's been really two Macrons. There's the European Macron that I I think has a very positive view of um, what he's been doing, you know, in terms of EU policy. Uh, at the same time, the domestic Macron is extremely controversial, especially when it comes to domestic policy. Um, we had an interior minister with Darmanin in France who was extremely on the right, um, sometimes saying things that were clearly on the line of Marine Le Pen, um, going through with a migration policy that also was, um, I would say, you know, criminalizing, um, helping migrants, um, not being really on the security side more than on the human rights side. So there's been really like a policy of Macron since he's been in power, especially like in the second uh, term now, that's been very much center right, if not very much on the right, maybe not far right. I think that's that's clear. But he's been trying to kind of integrate that a little bit as in Germany as well, they're trying to do to make sure you know that thinking that basically because you have like such a surge in the far right in France, that you need to respond to that by showcasing that the topics that the far right brings are important to you. And I think there's a few issues with that. The first one is, of course, with the appointment of Michel Barnier, which has also a very positive view in, in Europe, of course, because of the Brexit negotiations. And I think he did a fantastic job there. Um, but he did make some comments within the French context, putting into question, for instance, the primary prim, uh, primacy of EU law, putting into question the European Court of Justice, being, you know, very right, the Republican has also have also shifted very much from the center right to the right. Um, and they landed fourth in the legislative election. So nominating him as prime minister is completely legal, according to the French Constitution. But in France, you did speak, there was the talk of a déni démocratique, so kind of a democratic denial because the left had won. And I think that's problematic um, also because France is already quite an executive, you know, focused country. The executive power is very, very important in the Fifth Republic. Also, because we had a fourth republic beforehand, before 1958, where we had a parliamentary system and it didn't work out because it was way too unstable. So I, that also showcases how different it is. And that's what makes it also so difficult for the EU to have um, a policy safeguarding democracy in Europe. It's because our democracies are linked to the nation state in the end, and they, it makes it very difficult to find like the right you know, instruments to make sure that we um, support democracies in the different member states and not have like one... EU um, one size fits all, as you say. Um, but I think the fact that you have such a strong executive power in France, and that was even reinforced also by the terrorist attacks and the um, um, state of emergency that we had afterwards, which, which was basically then put also into law. Um, it wasn't really talked about that much, but once you have a state of emergency, and I think COVID was also very important because in Hungary, the same happened. They kind of put it into law, which means that, for instance, the police has way more powers when it comes to terrorism. You can kind of put someone in prison or like at least um, keep them in for much longer times. Mm -hmm. And that has happened. So you had really a, a stronger executive, which makes it even more dangerous because in 2027, we have the presidential elections coming up. And that means that even if, if Marine Le Pen or Jordan Bardella come to power, which could potentially happen, I mean, it very much depends on the party structures and if they find other yeah. candidates that are in a competition, she would be given um, a position where you already have, don't have to do that much, you know, to kind of destroy the rest of the checks and balances because the French parliament isn't very strong. If you compare it, for instance, to the German Bundestag, you don't yeah. have that's strong a civil society in France. So it's already a situation that is extremely dangerous and that gives even more weight to the presidential election in France.
Right. Thanks a lot, Sophie. Um, and now it's really high time, Max, to turn to you. <laughs> uh, because we're all very curious what's what's happening in the EP. The power of or the influence, the sway that a far-right party, that far-right parties can have, doesn't only depend on the percentage, right? It also depends on, in the European Parliament, how organized are they? How uh, how well are they willing to form groups and to also act coherently and so on? And after the EP elections, we saw two new groups emerging, the Patriots for Europe and the Europe of Sovereignist, Sovereignist Nations, right? So it's all it all seems long time ago uh, so can you refresh a little bit of memory like who are these groups how did they shape up uh why and yeah give us a little bit your take because again you're 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 coming speaking to us from strasbourg so uh, you got a first uh, first idea also of, of this first plenary week yes yes so thank you thank you for having me here well i wanted to start by saying that like taking on from what Sophie was saying, right? We didn't see a, a big far right surge, but we did see first a big reorganization of how far right parties work in parliament. And second, we did see an in, a small increase in, in, in far right representation, which in the end has changed the majorities overall. Also, especially since EPP won uh, big time, but that we'll, we'll talk about later, I believe. So going back to, to what happened. So let's go back to, to spring. I think... Um, we were all feeling and seeing and hearing that there would be a big rearrangement coming up. Uh, why? Well, it all started with uh, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, right? He started being very vocal about sort of reunif uh, reunifying all these patriots, all these globalists, um, well, anti-globalist um, parties, um, anti-Brussels parties in a way. So he started being very vocal, maybe not himself, but especially through his political director, Balaz Orban. He's the guy that does media for him. And, and, and well, that was the message he was. He, he made sure to, to make us all understand. So that was coming up. Then also, of course, peace seemed to jump on this is on this hype train of, of a new super group, right? Of, of unifying all these forces. Moraviezzi gave a lot of interviews, gave a lot of comments, also saying he would be interested in closing up with Orban. In, in, you know, trying to also bring Meloni together. And of course, there were some other smaller parties here and there that were also interested. Le Pen at some point also uh, started saying she would be interested in joining and in, in creating this super group together. Uh, but of course, then the question was always Meloni, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the Italian superstar at EU level. Um, Meloni never, well, to, it took her a long time to really take a position on whether she would want to cozy up with Orban and Le Pen or not. And we never really saw what she would do until after the elections, right? Mm -hmm. So, well, then we have all these, all these debates, all these rumors coming up. Then we have the elections. And after the elections, of course, before the elections, nobody wanted to commit right, to create new groups, because everyone wanted to wait to see what are the actual numbers, because to create new groups in Parliament, you need 23 MEPs, at least, from seven member states. And then, depending on the sides, you get more advantages, less advantages, and so on. Well, le more speaking time, more money, or and so on. So if everyone wanted to wait how, how, how many numbers they would get. And then once they had the numbers, they were able to start counting what would be more beneficial to them. I think it was first that, um, yeah, no, no. Then actually what we saw is that nobody announced anything until very late. We were all waiting, right? The mm -hmm. groups were forming. Of course, EPP, SND quickly did it because they have a long story. Greens too. The left took them a while too because they had to negotiate with Cinque Stelle uh, and so on. But then we, we were not seeing really a big supergroup until, of course, we had that press conference by, by Prime Minister Orban, Robert Kickel, the head of FPO, and uh, Jordan Bardella. Oh, no, no, no. And this, and this group, I mean, this, this this the Patriots, this is basically the ID group, new yeah. name, AfD out, Orban in, right? Yeah. Pretty and much. then later, I think a couple of more joined, for instance, from uh, the ECR, they got Vox. They got Vox. And yeah. from Anno, uh, sorry, from Renew, they got Anno, also Indeed. an interesting move, right? So this is basically the super group that we're looking at now. An ID, an, yeah. an enhanced ID minus AFD or something. 
Yeah, yeah. And in the in the AfD group, so then um, in, in, who is in the so in the AfD, the biggest force the, in the sovereign Europe of sovereign nations. This is basically only AfD as a relevant. I mean, as a big player, and then there are many small ones, if I remember. Exactly. Correctly. From uh, small ones from small member states, we have Mi Hazan from Hungary. We have um, Nuti Republika from Slovakia, mm. and so on. And and indeed, these are parties which, which partly only have one MEP, right? And we need twenty. I mean, to have a, to be a group, you need uh, twenty three MEPs from several countries, and I think yeah. they're twenty five. So this means yeah. if two MEPs drop out or three um, or one. Uh, they're rep or representatives of one member state, then they already have an issue and they lose the status as a group, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed. Yeah. I mean, there's... So what, like, what would you say? I mean, th this is a bit the composition, but what would you say in terms of differences? I mean, like, what is the dividing line between the two groups? Um, I mean, I mean, the dividing lines between, for instance, the ECR and the ID was always the typical Russia, Russia, Ukraine question, right? Uh, ECR being pro Ukraine and then Patriots being pro Russia. I don't see such clear dividing lines between these two new right ones now. Do you? Is there any uh, any um, mindset or policy division that is very clear? Well, I think the biggest dividing line, if you ask me, if with whom EPP wants to work with. Yeah. Because with PCR, they're happy to do so, and with Patriots, they don't. And that's the big dividing but line. But I meant, I meant also between the, I, sorry, between the Patriots and the, the, the Sovereign, the ES, ESN. So I think, indeed, some of these parties that are in ESN could have been also inside the Patriots. In fact, AFD could have been inside the Patriots, too. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if in some years we see these two groups also merging. But we need to remember what happened with AFD, with Maximilian Krah, there was this big scandal. So the party was way too toxic to, to, to bring them in, Patriots. Yeah. That's why they had to create two separate yeah. groups. AFD yeah. scrambled to find partners here and there. And that's why ESN is just 25. And they're at risk of disappearing if two, three MEPs decide um, to... Yeah. And, and I also think... Some of these Sorry, Catherine, yeah. yeah. Because also some of these groups, I mean, I think it becomes very clear in the Italian case, some of the domestic divisions between these groups, so Lega, uh, uh, Meloni wanting to distinguish herself from Matteo Salvini and Lega, also play a role, right? So in the sense that if you are, you can't be the kind of anti-immigration, anti-EU champion in Italy if Lega already has that position. So then you choose to be perceived as the one that sometimes does deals. And then, of course, Meloni can't make these shifts because there's a domestic consideration you saw yeah. that also you know like so it depends a little bit on how much the radical right or the far right depending on how we call these right as we were talking about at the beginning but let's say call them the far right are divided internally you see the same problem in the netherlands where you have several far right parties right that mm -hmm. will be different let's say in germany where so far or different so far in spain or shega in portugal or 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 you know, like th that also starts playing a role. It's not only about European politics. It's also about about kind of domestic divisions that these far right parties yeah. have. Domestic uh, divisions and also domestic reputation. No? I mean, especially the I think that leads back also what you said, Sophie, with the RN striving for moderation and the AfD for radicalization. So I think this is probably also a dividing line between the Patriots and the ESN, right? I AfD and Le Pen at the moment cannot go together. Because uh, Le Pen is afraid of, you know, losing, uh, uh, losing credibility, Sophie. Yeah, I just wanted to make three quick points. I think one of the things which will be really interesting to watch, of course, when it comes to the far right is whether they will be united in their positions and how active they're going to get. Because obviously for now, you know, it is always um, a bit of an absurdity to, to hit on the EU to say that you don't want the EU to exist. Even though they changed their positions, at least in France, Germany, uh, Poland and Italy, you couldn't see really them advocating for an exit. I think Brexit really did its work there, um, but they want to kind of undermine it. And then it's always saying, OK, you get paid by the EU, you're supposed to be a EU parliamentarian, for instance, but are you going to actually do some work or not? Which might also be better because they might be let blocking less and it's already a difficult kind of situation to find agreement anyway. That's my first point to kind of look at whether they will be active or not. The second yeah. point is, I saw a really interesting study done by another Catherine, Catherine Fieschi from Instituto Cateo with someone else, I think from Rome. Uh, and they looked at the policy positions of the EPP and ECR and all the different parties. And I think it was really interesting. So in the last mandate, and they 
they didn't find that many common policy positions between ECR and EPP. So I think that's an interesting one because, of course, from a political strategy point of view, I can understand von der Leyen saying we need to kind of, you know, have Italy on board because especially of the council, uh, I understand it for her as well because she will have to work with Roberto Fito. Um, but at the same time, if you look at the real policy, you could see way more convergence between social Democrats and EPP. And I think that's something really important to remember also for EPP politicians in the future. And my last point, um, also looking from the studies that we did or the country reports looking at the campaigns within the EP elections, it was really interesting to see that there it makes sense, for instance, for the for Meloni to be part of ECR and for Rassemblement National to be not part of it, because because she's in government and the main figurehead, she was really advocating for the, for instance, for the EU Pact on Migration and Asylum, saying mm -hmm. that you know, she had such an important uh, role to play in it. Um, that she made sure that you know migration is solved at European level, whereas uh, Rassemblement National really criticized it, saying that it doesn't go far enough. You know that we need to reform it. So you can already see that it doesn't make a difference. And uh, I mean, absurdly, I would say you could see that it was a far right government that actually wasn't hitting on the EU, but saying that you know it's it's a good policy that <laughs> what we did there. And I think that doesn't happen very much. Um, neither in EP election campaigns nor in national campaigns. Um, yeah. See, I think a shift because maybe she's in government, um, even though I would also s remain very critical as what has been negotiated in that as asylum pact. About I the level, Max, uh, there's David, just a thing on government. Sorry, one thing. I mean, I know the Netherlands is not the major, part, but the Dutch government parties are doing the exact opposite, right? So they're taking basically, they're asking for opt out on asylum, which they officially mm -hmm. have. Hungarians are backing them up. So I don't know if it really, again, then depends on mm -hmm. what you think is strategic in your system to do. If yeah. we had another far right party like Lega in the Netherlands, it might be a different situation. Right. So I think it, I, I think the thing is that these far right parties do not use Europe as a way to get stuff done because they don't want to have stuff done. They use it in order to kind of get yeah. their get their domestic means they're addressing their national, their, their domestic audiences, right? Yeah, and that is Max, uh, um, I think what we've seen also with the ID group in the last term, right? That they didn't do much, did they? And so what what do you, what, what is your take on this? How, how these groups have worked in the past? How, you know, what was the level of involvedness? And what do you expect now for the, for the, for the next term, for this term? Um, well, yes, it's not a secret. ID was not too involved in anything. When it comes now to to ESN, we still need to see what they will be doing. I think for the moment they're a bit lost internally trying to arrange its staff, for example, the way they work. I think it's a very, very new group. So, And, and for what I understand, everyone's very new. They don't have a lot of people with parliamentary experience to explain all of these newly elected MEPs, how things work. Mm -hmm. so, we still need to see for that. I wouldn't expect them to, to be too involved. On the other hand, we have uh, Patriots, which I think, uh, of course, we'll need to wait and see. But for what I've seen before the campaign and after the campaign when the groups were formed, I mean, this group is born out of their, 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 their urge, let's say, to change Europe, to really have an impact in Europe in their own way, but to actually try to influence. Or at least that's what they tell their voters, right? Afterwards, we'll need to see if this translates into amendments, if this translates into constructive negotiations. We'll have to see. But what they're selling to their voters is, hey, we're doing this big group to change Europe, to take power away from Brussels and so on. Um, whether they'll manage to have influence, as I was saying before, that depends on EPP. Mm -hmm. There's been a change of majorities. Uh, at Politico, we published this graph in one of the newsletters in which it, it, it clearly shows that in all committees, there's a right-wing majority now of ESN, Patriots, and EPP. Mm -hmm. Of course, EPP will never um, establish a structured dialogue with these two, um, well, and ECR, sorry, with ECR, yes, but with Patriots and ESN, they're in the Cordon Sanitaire. Yeah. Uh, but still, the approach... And by the way, it happened for the first time um, yesterday and today. There was this Venezuela declaration. And for the first time, EPP, ESR, ECR, Patriots, and ESN will all vote together. Uh -huh. And it's not like perhaps EPP hardly negotiated with all these groups, but rather I think EPP's approach is to put something on the table 
And if the others sign it, that's not their problem. Yeah. Our proposal yeah, exactly. What should the EPP say, right? I mean, they can say, you know, we're not actively cooperating, so we cannot keep them from voting with us, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's approach, and that already happened during the vice chairs of Libe. There was this vice chair from ECR that the, um, the more left wing forces, include, and also Renew, didn't like. However, EPP voted in favor with ECR, Patriots, and so uh -huh. on. So we're going to start we seeing it already now. First plenary session, and we already see this. First plenary, first plenary, the cordon sanitaire yeah. has been broken. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit more about the cordon sanitaire? So that means concretely that um, the far right parties, uh, so the two far right groups, they are excluded from committee chairs. Although, let's say by size, uh, they were actually allowed to have. I think Patrick so, probably would have two. Yeah, explain us. Let me, let me explain, because that's okay. an argument that Patriots is giving around, which is not true. Uh, yes, it's true that the parliament has this informal system called mm -hmm. don't, don't mathematical formula to locate seats, but that's informal. Nowhere is written that it's set in stone. And then that's the argument that Patriots is using um, to, to say that it was illegal what they did. In fact, they're threatening and even perhaps filing a lawsuit, King Agal, an MEP from... Uh, from FIDE said it uh, a long time ago when, when the committee chairs were allocated. Um, but in the end, yes, it's informal. It's not well written. It's just a way informally that the groups allocate seats. Indeed, they were allocated a chairmanship or two, and then many vice chairmanships. They were ousted from all of them. Also, they were allocated one delegation, one interparliamentary delegation, which has been given to someone else, not to patriots. Um, so indeed, that would be the cordon sanitaire. In the end, they don't want they want to keep them away from positions of power so that they cannot influence. However, still, it's important to note that they will still manage to have relevance at the COP. The Conference of Presidents is where all the presidents of all the groups meet and take important decisions, such as the program for the plenaries. And they are represented in the Conference of Presidents. Are they they're represented, of course. Yeah. They okay. have a president, right? Yeah, so of they have a group leader, yes. And each group, their vote is ponderated according to their political weight in MEPs. So they do have a lot of power. And that's yeah. why now, more recently, I've been hearing more and more chatter of SND, EPP, Greens wanting to transfer power from the COP back uh -huh. to the Bureau. Because in the Bureau, they're not, remind us, what is the Bureau and why are they not there? The Bureau is a more administrative body, but also very powerful politically. It's composed of the vice presidents of the parliament, the quaestors, and the president of the parliament, Roberta Metzola. Um, these, the vice presidents and the quaestors are elected, right? So they managed also to kick uh, Patriots and ESN out of these positions. ECR does have two vice presidents, but Patches and ECR and, and ESN uh, do not. So that's why there's this willingness to bring back certain decision-making powers to, yeah. to the Bureau. We'll need to see exactly how this looks like. For the moment, this is just uh, chatter. Um, but yeah, that's how they could even yeah. circumvent them in, in the COP, which is... Okay, so this means concretely COP, yes, Bureau, no... Uh, excluded from committee chairs, excluded from vice presidential chairs. Uh, however, what they can do is, of course, voting, classical parliamentary right. They can yeah. vote, they, vote. they can submit amendments, they can speak. In fact, you know, I was a bit, uh, it took me a, a long time, not a long time, a bit to realize that now every time Bardella or someone from Patriots will be the third one speaking because yeah. they're the third biggest yeah. force. And that doesn't change. Right, the, the, the order is by, by size. So it's Bardella and then, well, uh, Patriots and then ECR. Mm. So the, these two radical right forces are third and fourth, and that won't change. They can submit amendments, they can try to get some rapporteurships at the more, at the committee level. Maybe they can get some resolution here and there, some little jobs that they could get, because in the end, it's up to more individual MEPs and how well connected they are. But, um, yeah. Again, as I was saying, what they can do is then vote for EPP's positions and try to influence that and try to take sway EPP into their field, which is what Patriots, ESN, ECR are, are saying. I remember Procaccini after the election saying, you know, we're not, uh, no, after the von der Leyen vote, I think it was, yeah, we're not happy about, uh, about von der Leyen and we hope EPP goes more right wing with us, but they'll realize uh, sooner or later that, that they have to. 
So how how influential the far right can be depends very much on how much power they get from the mainstream parties, right? One. If one it, particular. It, yeah, 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 yeah. Especially. It's the kingmaker. They're the kingmakers. They can do anything they want. Yeah. If they go to the left, then the left. And uh, yeah, we only have we have to close. And I have one quick question to all of you to answer. So Sophie, really, like in ten seconds. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Which no, no, question? please, please. No, ah, no, okay, my, my last say. point. Okay, I thought it was like a question or a wish. Um, I think it's interesting maybe just to kind of like bring it up because we, we had a deep dive in the EP and I think it was fascinating. So Max, thank you so much for kind of giving us all the insights. I think it's interesting to see, of course, what role EPP will give them. I also like to look even more at the council in the past five years. I've realized how important the council was. Well, I knew it before, but you know, uh, what role it plays. And there, I think it would be really interesting to also see, of course, how, how the inter 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 interinstitutional relations will be. Uh, not only between the Commission and the EP, but also between the Commission and the Council, knowing that you now have Robert, uh, Roberto Fito as one of the executive vice presidents, um, that von der Leyen likes to underline that he's from Italy and not from ECR that much, but you know it will kind of affect, I think, um, the portfolios also because he has a lot of power in the end. Um, I think under his supervisory power, if I'm not completely mistaken, you have agriculture and transport as well, which are yeah, huge, for instance, for the Green Deal. And within yeah. the council, obviously, to see knowing that Scholz and Macron have been slightly weakened after the EP elections, how Meloni is going to position herself, uh, whether Orban will, you know, try to kind of get alliances or stay in his that kind of outsider position. So I think the kind of um, power dynamics that you will see there will be extremely important to yeah if you look at the general policy agenda for the next five years. I would love to hear more, but we ran out of time. And indeed, I mean, we, we looked at national level today, we looked at the European Parliament, but we didn't look at how national elections, of course, influence also the European level in a different institution, which is the Council and also the European Council. So I think we will have to meet again and uh, discuss this then. Uh, but I would like to, uh, one question, but really on 10 seconds each of you, is the ECR far right? Or is this the new right? Very quick answer. Catherine. It is the far right. The question is, how far right will the EPP become? Thanks, Sophie. I can only second that. I, It would have been the same answer for me. Max, what's your take? What I was going to say is that it depends on who you ask. It depends on <laughs> who you ask, what they call them. Very true. It's very true. And we will see probably also a shift in the next term in, 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 answers to, in the answer to this question, right? Thanks to all of you very much for this very interesting uh, hour. And uh, I wish you all and also to everyone that was watching. Thanks a lot for, for uh, following us. And uh, I wish you all a beautiful day. Speak soon. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Very nice to meet you also, Sophie and Max. Yeah, same. Bye. Bye.